In this hour, we are engaging in an international conversation on national security, the roots of terrorism around the world, and the successes and failures of international cooperation to contain it. In a few minutes, we're actually going to be going, we're going to be hearing from our Moscow and London bureaus, but first I have in studio John Altenberg. He is of counsel at Greenberg Trog, and he, where he actually specializes in contact, on contract litigation, international law, in the defense and homeland security sectors. I also have in the studio Sergei Markadanov. He is a visiting fellow at Russia and at the Russia and Eurasia program of the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both very much for coming in studio today. Thank you. It's, nice to be thank here. You. it's absolutely our pleasure to have you. Uh, John, if I could go ahead and start with you. Uh, the number of terrorist attacks each year is more than quadrupled in the decade since 9-11. Uh, is that, first of all, let me ask you, is that about right? Do you, do those numbers seem to coincide? I, I, I don't know. Okay. I accept, but I'd, I'd accept that for the purpose of the discussion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it depends on the territory. We would speak about Dagestan. We uh, could speak about uh, in Greece. In the case of Chechnya, after 2007 onwards, we could ab speak about uh, degrees of level of violence. It depends on the territory. Now, but overall, internationally, uh, we generally it does seem that reports indicate that we've seen an, actually an increase. Uh, but but go, let's uh, holding on to that premise. Let's accept that premise for a little bit. Let's assume that this is true. Now, this is according to the Global Terrorism Index. On the other hand, we've got you know this Boston tragedy, rising bomb attacks in Iraq, Iraq and Syria, the Toronto New York train plot. Now, all of that's just happened in the last so many weeks. I'm going to start with you, John. Let me ask you: Are we any safer from terrorism? Given you know we have a homeland security that was put together after the 9/11 bombings, we also have a, you know a huge amount. Of, uh, of efforts at international cooperation, U.S. policy focusing on anti-terrorism efforts and so forth. Where are we after 9-11 now, you know, so many years ago? I think we're safer in a couple of respects and, and, and not as, not safer in, in, from the American people's perspective. Uh, we're, we're safer in the sense that uh, everything that's happened since 2001 uh, probably serves as a deterrent to uh, likely terrorists. I mean, it's more difficult to commit a terrorist act now. It's more difficult. Do, do you agree with that, Sergey? Do you think so? Uh, it's interesting and controversial question. I think uh, frequently we restrict our analysis by uh, instruments of counterterrorism fight, but it, it's it's not enough. And the story uh, with the Tsarnaevs demonstrated that uh, it's not compulsory to be a member of uh, worldly known terrorist networks like Al Qaeda and so on. So and, some and that's actually the point, right? I mean, isn't this the way Al Qaeda has worked in the past? I and mean, we've talked about, uh, you know, certainly the NSA and others have talked about the, our great successes against Al Qaeda. But part of the point is that. They are disparate. They are m multiple cells that are largely disconnected, and that is kind of the root of their success. And as you say, I mean, we see this here and now. I mean, we have these Tsarnaev brothers. We, d you know, were they actually how closely affiliated with the uh, the Chechen rebels um, who have been designated as terrorists by you know multiple countries, Russia and you know in the U.S. to some degree. Um, at the same time, they could have been belonged to a faction. They could have been, uh, um, you know, or just kind of their own cell. I mean. Right? I mean, isn't that how terrorism works? By the way, my, my, my first correction. Uh, na nowadays, it's not quite uh, relevant to speak about Chechen rebels, because situation around the North Caucasus uh, dramatically changed after uh, the uh, early 90s or mid, uh, mid of 90s. I read uh, immediate reactions on terrorist bombing in uh, Boston, and uh, I felt many people here are hostages of uh, previous agenda, old agenda when uh, ideas of Chechen self-determination was the uh, topic number one. Nowadays, Chechnya is only part of the uh, Caucasus Islamist uh, growth. And if we, we would compare the number of terrorist attacks in Chechnya, Dagestan and Ingushetia, number of uh, violence cases in Dagestan and Ingushetia much more than Chechnya, uh, mm -hmm. the situation was uh, changed. John, can you look at some of the other parts of the world? And, uh, I mean, is it, moving away, let's say, from the Caucasus for just a moment, though we'll obviously be talking about that quite a bit this hour. Uh, the, uh, again, are we seeing a rise in terrorism? And what are some of the causes? And what, I mean, is the U.S. reacting, or in the international community, reacting appropriately? Uh, I really don't know if we're seeing a rise in terrorism elsewhere. We, we, we may very well be. Um, my comment earlier 
was uh, was U.S. centric, and and it was a pretty mundane comment, really. It wasn't on a very high intellectual plane. I mean, all I meant was there's been some deterrence in the last ten years by virtue of locking airplane doors and make making it harder for people to to uh, to conduct terrorist acts. So in in that sense, you know, we are we have deterred some terrorism, no doubt, and we've made it more difficult for people to do it. Uh, the the third prong of that that I that I alluded to was that you know we we, we can't really be safe because it's too easy. I mean you have to mm -hmm. you have to protect against everything, and a terrorist just has to find one weakness and, and and do something there. What's surprising to me is that they have there haven't been more acts like what happened in Boston last week. Yeah, you would expect more actually because of how easy. I would yeah. definitely. I mean we saw if you were here at the time we saw several years ago when a couple of domestic uh, criminals literally brought this whole area to a halt because they were you know using a sniper it, yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean it was it was it was uh it was it was scary in the sense that it was how, how quickly we slowed down and and, and were paralyzed uh, by those acts, and and I'm, I thought at the time, geez, some of these groups that are interested in conducting terrorist acts would take a page out of those guys' book and make it tough in in lots of cities. All right, uh, once again, that's John Altenberg. We also have in studio Sergey Markadonov, but I, I do actually want to go over to our Moscow studio, where uh, presenter Marina Joshi is is uh, holding on the line there. Marina, I do understand uh, you have uh, you have an expert there. Uh, who can tell us a little bit more about the caucuses themselves and uh, and kind of what where what how that connects to what happened in Boston and Absolutely. terrorism around the world? Thanks very much, Carmen, for this. Uh, in fact, this is perfect timing. I just just wanted to butt in and uh, tell our audience there that we do have two experts uh, who are ready and willing to talk about whether terrorism globally is on the rise or is it declining and whether trends are here. In the studio with me, I have our political analyst Dmitry Babich and uh, Mark Sloboda, who's from Department of Sociology and International Relations at the Center for Conservative Studies at Moscow State University. Well, uh, gentlemen, as uh, we've just been uh, hearing from our Washington studios there, the talk on uh, the tendencies and trends in global terrorism, whether it's growing or declining, what can you say here? I mean, uh, specifically bringing Russia into the context. I mean, uh, some say that Russia has seen a dramatic decline in terrorist attacks in recent years. So what could the world learn from its experience? Well, I can speak from my perspective. Uh, you know, if you go to the internet, you, you might you might notice that I wrote quite a few stories about Chechnya because, uh, as uh, a correspondent of uh, several newspapers, I traveled to Chechnya during the first war, and then during the short period of the so-called Chechen independence. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't quite agree with Sergei that uh, you can divide the uh, Chechen movement into. Islamists, you know, bad Islamists and nice national Democrats. Uh, I think this is a mistake that a lot of U.S. media has been uh, making, not only in Chechnya, but also now uh, in Syria. You see how the media presents uh, that uh, among the rebels we have these nice uh, na uh, nationalists and Democrats whom we can actually send arms. So who are and, we actually dealing with uh, here, Dmitry? Well, right who now, is the major threat? I think from the very beginning there was a very strong Islamist streak in, in, the, in the Chechen rebel movement. Uh, that streak, of course, has grown. Uh, I agree with Sergei that now uh, part of the Chechen uh, Islamists uh, migrated to Ingushetia or to Dagestan, or they prefer to commit their terrorist acts there. Also, these areas themselves, they have some homegrown Islamist terrorists. And I think that actually uh, the world has, is becoming less and less safe uh, because uh, even if um, uh, the Tsarnaev brothers were not connected to any specific uh, registered international terrorist organization, I think it's not really important. And, you know, my impression is that the U.S. government wants the situation to look like that because okay. that would make them less dangerous. The, the problem is that they were, were militant Islamists. They held these views. And now that thanks to the so-called Arab Spring, we're going to have at least five more Islamist states in the world. And now that uh, uh, because of the stupidity of international press, a lot of Islamists in Syria get romanticized, just like uh, the Chechen rebels were romanticized. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to see more and more acts like this because, you know, I think the, the, the main surprise for the American public was the fact that these people were so ungrateful. We, uh, I mean, uh, let's be frank about it. The American media supported the Chechen reb rebels. 
the bulk of it. I mean, the mainstream support of the Chechen rebels. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the, the Americans obviously expected the Chechen rebels to be grateful. You know, uh, we are giving them refugee status. We're not giving up uh, the so-called Chechen foreign minister, Mr. Ahmadov, to Russia. We don't uh, honor Russia's extradition requests. So they're going to be grateful to us. Well, that's not the case because these people are never grateful. So it's interesting to see how the tables reversed here. Well, uh, I would like to actually ask you a question about uh, the U.S. foreign policy in uh, light of what happened, whether it's likely to change or not. You see, the U.S. started a military campaign in Iraq and Afghanistan on the premise that it needs to protect itself and it needs to fight uh, terrorism because this is where it saw the threat coming from. Now. In what way, uh, Dimitri or Mark, for the matter, uh, does the recent attack in Boston show that uh, the U.S. current anti-terrorism strategy may not be as effective and as a result needs to be reviewed? Well, I think uh, we can safely assume that the United States is not going to change its foreign policy in the Middle East because of a, a relatively small terrorist attack uh, uh, that is essentially domestically grown uh, in Boston. Um, but um, the roots uh, of the terrorism, we can clearly see that Jokar Tsarnaev has uh, admitted to his interrogators in the United States that his uh, principal motivation, uh, that of him and his brother, was the uh, U.S. hegemonic uh, wars of invasion and occupation yeah, they throughout were the Islamic world. about the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes. But the question here is, are we likely to see copycat attacks now in the future from the people who share the same sentiment well, as it, the brothers it, did? It's not just a question of copycat mm -hmm. attacks. I mean, they are not the first and they will not be the last. We're looking at uh, another facet of our globalized world connected via the internet, uh, media, at you know incredible speeds now, um, where they view themselves uh, scattered throughout many different countries, uh, uh, what we can call radicalized uh, uh, Islamists. They view themselves as part of a greater global community of Islamists. They how does that happen, my question is? I mean, how do these people get together? How do they unite? How do they spread their ideas? Okay. Because, you know, we don't know yet. The investigation is still on. We don't know whether the br brothers yes. actually belong to any of the militant groupings. Some are saying that they were radicalized online. Yeah, I think that is the most likely uh, scenario from everything we've seen from their communications via Twitter, YouTube, and so on. It doesn't require, uh, terrorism doesn't require participation in an active cell. Terrorism now is an idea. It's an idea of a world, a worldview that is under assault. People are self-radicalizing through forums, through internets. It doesn't require any kind of active training cell or anything like that. They view themselves as part of a global community and their world under assault and they're fighting back in any which way they can. Is there any way we can fight them back too? I mean, is there any way we can actually um, counterweight their power, their influence? What can we do? Well, maybe it's time for me, Dmitry Babich, to say if he wants here. I think that uh, President Putin today during his phone in uh, with uh, the television and radio, he said that uh, we should fight uh, this danger together. But I am not uh, sure that this is going to be the case, because we have the experience of 2001. Right after 9-11, there was a brief honeymoon between Russia and the United States. Russia helped the United States to topple the Taliban regime. But then, as uh, the memory of that terrible terrorist act receded into the past, uh, the United States returned to, it all, to its old ways, viewing Russia as, well, let's put it mildly, not the greatest of friends. And I'm afraid it's going to be the same now. I mean, uh, it's just incredible how the media easily forgets uh, its own mistakes. For example, you know, just today we had this news from that mother of the terrorists saying that uh, they never killed anyone, that this was a setup, a conspiracy of special services. And obviously the American media views it as, uh, well, not very seriously. Well, I remember how in 1999 the mainstream American media supported conspiracy theories about Russians themselves blowing up their apartment blocks. And how in uh, uh, 2004, uh, after the school siege in Beslan and after the theater siege in 2002, you might get an impression from the American media that uh, it was actually the Russian government who was to blame for everything. The terrorists were not to blame for anything. So I'm afraid in, in some time uh, when the memory of this terrible terrorist act recedes into the past, 
I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid uh, the Americans are going to return to the old ways. Mark, what do you think? Well, if I could go back to your original question of what can be done to stop terrorism. Now, we can see that this type of terrorism has obviously a global communications and character, but it also always has a local character and context. Um, so there's no one single magic bullet to ending this type of terrorism. It's a tactic. Um, all this has political, ethnic, religious, economic motivations that have to be addressed. The context is everything. Now, if we take a look at an example of Russia in the Chechen Republic under Ramzan Kadyrov, we've seen a remarkable amount of success over the last decade in reducing terrorism and violence through a combination of an autonomous government and self-rule in the Chechen Ethnic Republic, uh, a firm hand, which is obviously... Um, often single-mindedly presented as in the press, um, but we've also seen a huge influx of federal funds bringing jobs, reconstruction, even a United Nations Development Program award for Grozny, um, rebuilding education in universities, and I think perhaps most importantly uh, is promoting the institutions and moral guidance of the traditional moderate Sufi Islam of the region. Um, a lot can be learned from this local application uh, I think to um, wider global uh, uh, absolutely trends. mark and uh, we'll talk about it in more detail later as to you know what can be done uh, to integrate uh, different cultural and ethnic communities into one culture but uh, now though I'd like to uh, go back to the 9-11 attack we mentioned it briefly today and since 9-11 the Boston attack is the biggest on US soil our US correspondent uh, Roman and Mamanov has spoken to some of the locals and they believe there is some symbolic connection between the two there. Let's now take a listen to this. That's a very uh, strange sign that just 100 meters from this finish line here in the center of Boston is located memorial for victims of 9-11. Um, and uh, it's like, and some people here told me that it's like a sign, uh, probably. And some, uh, some of the local citizens uh, told me that probably, you know, they think that uh, there is a kind of connection between uh, events uh, of 9-11, uh, because if, if you remember, uh, one of uh, flights uh, which was destroyed uh, to um, uh, World Trade Center in New York City uh, was uh, departed from um, uh, Boston. So uh, that was our correspondent talking to locals there and the impression that he gets uh, from the ground. Now, Mark, briefly, do you think there is some connection, albeit symbolic, between the two acts? Uh, sure. I, I think we can see uh, both 9-11 and the Boston bombings as a uh, reaction to uh, a process of globalization that's seen infringing on uh, a strict traditional worldview of Islam. Um, and um, we can um, see that both have uh, their motivations primarily within U.S. foreign policy, not at home, uh, not domestic policy, but you know, they're not attacking them for their democracy and freedom. They're attacking them because of their foreign policy uh, in the Islamic world. The support of dictators such as Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Qatar. Uh, of course, the uh, support of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. The hundreds of U.S. military bases that litter uh, the Middle East with uh, tens of thousands of troops. Um, and uh, the, the actual invasions, regime change operations, shadow wars, assassinations mm -hmm. by drones, etc. Et so a whole bunch of uh, international and domestic issues there. Well, you know, looking at the Ternayev brothers profile on the surface, we see the two young people with very promising potential there. Johar, uh, who's 19 and who's in custody at the moment, was awarded a scholarship to pursue further education, and according to his father, he wanted to be a brain surgeon. Tamerlan, who's now dead, 26, was an amateur boxer who had reportedly taken time off college to train for competition and described himself as a very religious, non-drinker, and non-smoker. Now, my question is, how does somebody like this become a terrorist, and how much of a threat does homegrown terrorism pose to us? And specifically, more importantly, where do the roots come from? For that, I, now, I would like to cross to London to Brandon Cole, who's got, hopefully, the answers for us there.
Thanks very much, uh, Marina. Um, and um, I'm joined in the studio here in London by Sally May. She's a project manager for the group Faith Matters. It's a non-for-profit organisation which works to reduce extremism and interfaith and intrafaith tensions. Um, as we heard there, we've, t- we've heard about the, the, the religious aspect of the debate over um, what the perpetrators, what the motive was uh, for the perpetrators of the bombings in Boston. Um, and I suppose I was just wondering, first of all, just with regard to uh, an act like that in Boston, I mean, does that um, romanticize uh, Islamists, say, here in the United Kingdom? Are those, are those acts kind of, uh, in your experience, from your group's perspective, seen as, as, um, uh, as a blow against the West, perhaps? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever really come across the idea of romanticizing Islamic militancy, um, especially in the media, as, as, as one of the groups were talking about there. Um, I do think it, it, it probably is perceived by some uh, as a blow to the West, but it, it's such a diverse community from, from many different areas of the world, um, especially in the British Muslim community, um, who currently occupy um, large parts of, of the UK. What we don't know, we can't really generalise too much about the opinions and where the motivations come from. As with any religious tradition, it's it's um, all about interpretation of scripture and many different types of interpretation. But I suppose what, what's been very um, telling, I suppose, in, in terms of... Um Homegrown terror, I suppose, here in the United Kingdom. We, we heard to, t- today there was there were three British Muslims jailed for preparing acts of terrorism. One of them was actually um, uh, a, a well, three British men. One was a white Muslim convert, a former police community support officer, and they were jailed for four years and up to up to five years actually. I mean, what does this say about the state of? Um, uh, of, of homegrown terror. This is something that is quite unusual, and I suppose it's a, it's, it's an aspect of the debate that um, that really will affect and impair um, interfaith relations and the relationship of the Muslim community uh, with the with the society, with society at large. Yeah, absolutely. I think homegrown terrorism is something a different sort of concept um, than wider terrorism. I do believe that that in some communities that are, that become radicalised, or even some individuals that become radicalised, it's not necessarily a community-wide thing. Uh, this does present the wider Muslim community in the UK with a with a problem and sort of an idea of collective guilt and having to sort of apologise on behalf when really th- that's uncalled for and, and we need to sort of focus on the positive stories, as I think the media in Britain and the, and the US have done since the Boston bombings on the positive stories, um, the Muslim communities relating to other faith groups and, and wider society and, and how this is really representative of only a small part of the community. But I mean, and when they were passed, when their sentences were passed, uh, Richard Dart, Imran Mahmoud and Jahanga Alom, who were sent down and jailed for preparing acts of terrorism here in the United Kingdom, they said, judging is only for Allah. Now, when that makes the headlines in the British press, um, that reinforces uh, th- that reinforces the idea, a, p- a perception perhaps that the community has of Islam in the United mm. Kingdom. Those sorts of headlines certainly increase Islamophobia here, don't they? Yes, I'd agree. They increase a, a negative opinion of Muslims. I think Islamophobia is often a, a tricky term to use because um, it, it, it suggests the phobia of the religion Islam itself. I think what we're seeing in our pro- in our organisation, we run a project called the Tell Mama Project, which stands for measuring anti-Muslim attacks. And so we actually map and and can statistically see what happens after an international event like the Boston bombings or something domestic like this. Um, And the sort of online abuse and also street-based attacks that happen to the British Muslim community. And it does peak after these sort of things. So so in what parts of the country does it peak and what sort of uh, statistic have uh, have you been seeing? So it's... (laughs) There are hotspots in different parts of the country, but also it's a new project, so it's very hard actually at this stage to generalise about where the the problem is mainly in the country. We see hotspots in London, we see hotspots in sort of Leeds, Bradford, those sorts of areas. But um, I'd like to jump in, Sally, if I may. This is Marina Moscow. Uh, well, you see on a number of occasions some Western leaders, and uh, David Cameron, no exception, said that multiculturalism failed. Do you agree with this or disagree? I mean, to what extent can we actually integrate immigrants and first-generation Brits that are born to families who've immigrated from uh, countries like Pakistan and others? I think we can do a lot better 
uh, at integrating these communities. Uh, I do believe multiculturalism is still something that we should strive for, but but to maybe leave behind the label, it's about educating ourselves better about other communities and other faiths and in order to understand each other better and and share in our sort of new British community, as it were, or our evolving British community, that we need to celebrate its diversity. And I do believe that these sort of attacks and stories and prosecutions do make that a sort of uphill struggle. But when David Cameron says something like multiculturalism has failed, that mm-hmm. certainly is fuel, isn't it, to the um, anti-Islam lobby, I suppose. It's um, it's not perhaps the becoming language of a prime minister, but he perhaps has a point, doesn't he? I mean, he's talking about integration and the lack thereof. Um, and uh, we can, I mean, in terms of what we have here today, three British Muslims jailed for preparing acts of terrorism, two of whom um, uh, have um, uh, their roots in South Asia. That doesn't suggest any degree of integration, does it, if they see Britain as the enemy? Yes, uh, I do believe that we can do better by immigration. I do believe that the government is, in fact, putting a lot of effort into better immigration and better community cohesion and and that sort of focusing on the communities themselves and how to how to bridge the barriers really better. Um, but in terms Let's of, now uh, uh, ask back to you, our Marina. colleagues in Washington. Yes, yeah, sorry, Brandon. I uh, just, just wanted to ask uh, the view in Washington, D.C., what's happening across the pond. I mean, we're hearing that uh, the recent attack in Boston may actually, some politicians may review the immigration reform. So how is multiculturalism seen there and how might that affect uh, the immigration reforms in the United States? Thank you, Marina. Actually, I'd like to love to toss that question to John Altenberg, who we have in the studio. Uh, you know, John, there is a lot of talk. Republicans, in particular, there have been a handful of Republicans, notably Chuck Grassley, who've recently uh, connected this immigration reform effort, saying, you know, maybe we don't want to move quite so fast. But, uh, you know, how much of an issue is it? We, we, of course, learned that the Tsarnaev brothers were here legally. And as you pointed out, I mean, really just about anybody could commit this. Um, wh- what do you think about th- this connection? I'm, d- I'm disappointed that uh, the politicians are using this incident as a basis for opposing or, or questioning in any way in immigration reform. We obviously need immigration reform. And uh, and, and I think that this uh, the, the Boston incident... Sh- really shouldn't play at all in immigration reform. So it's it's an obvious political move, and they're capitalizing on it for political purposes. It's very disappointing as a citizen. Uh, at the same time, uh, what uh, you know, there is obviously a need for immigration reform. Part of that does entail, uh, you know, the uh, proposals that we see does entail restrictions, uh, you know, better border uh, patrols, that kind of thing, more restrictions on people who are actually coming in and overstaying their visas and that type of thing. Would that not be something that could potentially curb uh, letting people like the Tsarnaev brothers, not necessarily, obviously, that we're here legally, but people from getting in who might actually be coming in to cause the country harm, perhaps even some of the uh, 9-11 bombers? I, I think that immigration reform and, and appropriate immigration policy is all about having standards that you can meet and making sure you have accountability and predictability. And if you if you address those issues, then you, you can have an effective immigration policy. And it shouldn't be aimed to keep, well, it should be aimed probably to keep terrorists out. You know, or people who want to do to to do you know bad things in this country, but they don't announce themselves at the border. They don't say, "Hi, hey, you know what? I'm I'm here to you know make a bomb." And 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 I'm not sure immigration policy should address that type of an issue. There are other ways to secure the borders, and other ways to to I mean, in terms of security itself, you know? intelligence, for example. Exactly. I mean, we want to, uh, but if you look at the FBI, uh, there were people who responded who noted that even though uh, Tamerlan Sarnayev was on the FBI. He was something uh, being watched by the F- FBI to some degree. They get, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even such types of red alerts, red flags regarding different people. This one particular one came from Russia, and the FBI actually did talk to Tamerlan after he came back uh, from the caucuses. Uh, do I mean is intelligence? Is it? Are we simply not putting enough resources in our intelligence efforts? You know, it, it occurred to me when I heard the criticism from from uh, politicians that it may be a resource issue uh it, it's uh it's it's interesting and that's a euphemism it's interesting that the people uh criticizing the lack of perfection who are using their their wonderful 2020 hindsight are the same people that couldn't pass a budget a year or two ago 
and that are now in the throes of what they've brought on all of us, you know, and, and they're the ones now demanding perfection from the intelligence agencies and the, and the law enforcement agencies. Uh, Sergey, I want to toss this over to you because, uh, one, there's also been some uh, criticism that it could be Russia's, the you know, Russian Federation's and the U.S.'s frosty relationship, you know, the currently this frosty relationship that didn't allow for the maximum amount of cooperation between the two countries and that that might have had some impact. Uh, and on top, you know, on top of that, after the 9-11 bombings uh, happened, you know, we did hear, for example, Vladimir Putin say, hey, you know what, see, this shows you should have paid more attention to uh, these, these what he called terrorists there in the caucuses and so on, instead of, you know, this prior support. I mean, Americans do remember uh, the the Baslan, I think, for, to the most degree, the Baslan school attack in, in 2004. But then, you know, other than that, and other than, you know, some of the things that were going on in the 90s, it's not really necessarily on our radar because they haven't in the past seemed to be really directed at us. It seems to have been more of Russia's problem. Is that the wrong philosophy? <laughs> Good question. I think uh, the problem of U.S.-Russian uh, cooperation could not be uh, effective if it would be selective. What we see uh, on uh, the American approaches, United States uh, are ready to uh, help uh, the Russian territorial integrity, or maybe you know in 2010 Doku Mara was included in the terrorist lists. In 2011, Caucasus Emirate was also included, it designated like terrorist organization. But uh, this topic is rather narrow, because uh, it's, it's impossible to effectively resolve the problem of the Caucasus uh, beyond the uh, other topics, like Middle East in general, Syria in particular, Afghanistan, or some other topics. But as for foreign policy aspirations, the West, and especially the United States, are not ready to understand the Russian concerns. Why Russia is so stubborn uh, in uh, approach to Middle East? Because uh, there is an understanding that secular regimes like Syria or Egypt supported Russian territorial integrity and fight against Chechen separatism, radical Islamism, and so on. In the case of change regime and growing, rapidly growing Islamization, approach could be very different. And many guys who are fighting now in Syria and Middle East could uh, support more or less the growing Islamism within Russia. This is why we need uh, to understand that the North Caucasus only is not a topic. Well, at this it's, point, it's those... necessary to take into account the wider context. Yes. And uh, let me briefly uh, fix one uh, misunderstanding between me and Dmitry. I didn't oppose uh, good national Democrats to bad Islamists. I talked only on the development of discourses in the Caucasus. In the early 90s, the ethnic nationalism was the dominant discourse. It was not good, by the way. I wish to uh, tell uh, right now that uh, since the first day of uh, separatist project, and then when Islamism became a dominant discourse in the Caucasus, anti-Semitism and anti-Westernism has been a very serious component of guys in the Caucasus. Dudaev, Maskharov, and then Islamists who replaced them as the dominant figures. Let's see statements of Doku Umarov and other leaders of uh, the Caucasus Jihad. Anti-Westernism is a very important component. Anti-Americanism, by the way. Think, All right. Well, Sergey, you know, you we are pressing. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, um, time is pressing here. And I'd like to turn to the gentleman that I have in the studio with me. Uh, that's uh, Mark Sloboda and uh, Dmitry Babich. Dmitry, is there anything that you, that you would like to comment on so far from what uh, we heard in Washington, yeah. D.C.? Yes. And, uh, and it's actually nice that we had this exchange with Sergey, because I think it's very important to explain. Uh, the Western media, when it divides, uh, uh, you know, the, the Chechen movement into nice uh, nationalist Democrats and bad Islamists, is making a huge mistake. Because I agree with Sergey. I actually interviewed Dudayev, uh, and in a lot of his interviews, you know, Dudayev was the first Chechen president. He was extremely anti-Western, mm. and a lot of uh, leaders of the so-called Chechen resistance were like that. But the Western media just didn't want to notice it because what was important for them was that they were challenging this terrible uh, Russian government, you know, this Russian imperialism, as they called it. So indeed, it shields our view. Okay. Well, before we uh, toss uh, back to London, I'd like to ask Mark, you know, the question that I asked earlier about uh, multiculturalism, whether it is indeed possible to integrate uh, culturally and ethnically diverse groups into one culture. 
Okay, well, uh, first I'd like to say that the issue of multiculturalism in Russia and the West are completely different, because mm -hmm. in Russia, these uh, Islamic... Uh, Russia has 185 ethnicities, and they've been part of Russia for well over 200 years. You can go all the way back to the time of the Golden Horde. So it's a completely different issue. They are intrinsic parts of Russia, um, and we've been dealing with these issues for hundreds of years. Um, in the West, these are relatively new introductions of completely ahistorical uh, uh, and quite different uh, values-laden populations. That being said, um, if we take a look at earlier uh, immigration trends, multiculturalism hasn't been given enough time. But even when we take a look at the acts of terror that have resulted, um, as the most clear evidence of the supposed failure of multiculturalism. It is not because of domestic immigration. It's not uh, domestic policies. It's not because of economic situations. It is because of the country's foreign policy in the Middle East and the connection that these people still feel to their uh, uh, co-religious uh, uh, in those countries. That is what is the cause of. If we didn't see wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we wouldn't see the majority of the terrorist attacks in the Western countries that we're seeing today. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, multiculturalism in the West and Russia uh, is not the same thing because Russia is a multicultural country already and uh, uh, there are many different confessions here uh, coexisting uh, with each other. Uh, Dmitry, you wanted to add something very briefly before yeah, we toss well, to I, Brandon I, in London. I think that uh, in, in the, during the history of mankind, we already had several, um, actually many dozens of successful multicultural societies. Ancient Greece, I don't know, uh, even Abkhazia before the civil war there. Uh, so you can't really say that multiculturalism failed because there were lots of successes. Mm -hmm. what, what but indeed it's still failed evolving is, thing, yeah, yes. What indeed failed is the Western foreign policy in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq and unfortunately Russia, where the West is just butting in without mm -hmm. understanding where it is butting in. Okay, well at this point I'd like to turn to Brandon who is in London for some conclusive thoughts as uh, we'll soon be wrapping up our live coverage. Indeed. Thanks very much, uh, right Marina. Enough. In London here with me, Sally May from the group Faith Matters. I mean, I suppose that what we've been hearing there is, is the idea of um, a degree of Islamophobia, I suppose, present. But is it, what are the dangers of branding one religion as a haven of terrorism? I mean, it, it can't help, can it? No, absolutely not. And I, and I think that when we're looking at, like I was saying before, interpretation of scripture, that's actually common across all religions. And, and sometimes that can be... Um, can promote violence and sometimes it can promote peace um, and labelling a huge community in it and a, and a religion that encompasses so many people across the world it is not helpful um, in when talking about terrorism and violence. But indeed, part of the discourse I've been noticing on Twitter, for instance, Richard Dawkins, the, um, the, the, the one of well, Britain's great uh, scientists, philosophers, whatever, he, 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 t he often tweets that Islam is a dangerous force. He invokes terrorism acts like uh, the ones such as in Boston um, and thwarted terror attacks um, here, in, here in Britain. I mean, what kind of impact does that have on the debate uh, about religion, uh, about its links with terrorism, um, and given that he's also often made claims about, um, about other faiths as well? Yeah, I think... I think with Dawkins in particular, where where he falls down on it is his total lack of respect for all religious beliefs, and I think that sets him up then for a, a counter attack where he believes that anyone who has religious beliefs are, are not reasonable. I think he's picked out Islam in particular as a dangerous religion, and I do think that um, he has a wide audience and he has a lot of followers, and it doesn't help. Um, and again, he he is talking about Islam as a religion and 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 what it says and what it promotes and it's his perspective on that. I think what it then can lead to is anti-Muslim sentiment, and that's quite different. That's targeting Muslim individuals rather than targeting the religion and what it promotes or what it stands for or what he considers it to promote and stand for. So is it incumbent, just finally, on the Muslim community in the UK to improve relations with the wider community, or is it, uh, it, does it w work both ways? Oh, it absolutely works both ways, yeah. I think there's a lot of work that, that the Muslim community can do and there's a lot of work that other faith groups and wider society non-believers can do, I think. We've got a long way to go, and it's our duty to educate ourselves and make links and break down our assumptions and re-examine what we think about people and 
and religion in itself. Well, obviously, we could talk about this for all day, but I'd just like to thank my guest here in the London studio, uh, Sally May, project manager at the group Faith Matters. That's an organisation that works to reduce extremism and interfaith and interfaith tensions. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, in, in Moscow, Marina Joshi was the host there. She was joined by Mark Sloboda from the sociology department at Moscow State University and our political commentator, Dmitry Babich. And in our Washington studio with Carmen Russell Sluchansky was Major General John Alton and Sergei Makedonov. Thank you all for joining us on The Voice of Russia in London.